and the members of Lakeland Public Television. Thank you. Closed captioning for Lakeland Currents is supported by the Minnesota Department of Commerce, Telecommunications, Access Minnesota, and Nisswa Tax Service. Nisswa Tax Service, tax preparation for businesses and individuals. Across from City Hall in Nisswa and online at nisswatax.com. Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to Lakeland Currents. This is our second show of the year, and it's going to be not only very interesting, but we're not going to get it all done in our show tonight. Uh, so we're going to have another segment of this show on November 15th. So this is a two-part series on nanotechnology. I think you're going to find it really fascinating stuff. I'd like to introduce my guest this evening. Uh, Deb New uh, Newberry is the chair at the Nanoscience Technology in that department at Dakota County Technical College. And Dr. Stephen Campbell is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Minnesota. Just to give you a, just a little brief background about these two people, because they're very, very skilled and knowledgeable in this area. I'm, I think I can safely say that. Uh, Deb is an author of a book, a co-author of a book, The Next Big Thing is Really Small, How Nanotechnology Will Impact Your Business. And she also has done a lot of work on radiation analysis on satellite systems, and a lot of the satellites in orbit today, have her work on them, as I understand it, Deb. Uh, Dr. Campbell has uh, got a BA in physics from St. Thomas University and a uh, MS and a PhD in physics from the Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. Uh, he joined the University of Minnesota in 1986. He's on the faculty of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and is a director of nano, the Nano Fabrication Center at the university. And we're going to actually start out this program with a little two-minute clip uh, on the program at the University of Minnesota. So if we could have that, Tom, we'll get into that right away. Nanotechnology, of course, people understand that it's things that are small. And this is true. It, it's things that are small, but you have to have a feel for the scale of smallness. If you were to take a piece of hair and cut it, that's about 75,000 uh, nanometers in diameter. Anything from 100 nanometers smaller is considered nanotechnology. If you are an engineer and you're trying to make some kind of a device, uh, a golf club or a tire or a dental filling or what have you, uh, you look for what material will solve the problem that you're trying to address. And what nanotechnology provides you is a new way to change the properties of materials to give you the desired outcomes. The Nanofabrication Center is an organization that allows people to develop new applications in nanotechnology. We train people from academic environments and uh, from private industry. Uh, medical device companies are extremely interested in this area. High technology materials companies use our facility and also energy. We're looking forward to the opening of our new facility in late 2013 in the Physics and Nanotechnology Building. Our usage of our current facility has grown by over an order of magnitude over the last decade, uh, and, and we just physically don't have space to put the people and put the machines in. So part of that is uh, having more room to be able to serve more users. Having a facility like the Nanofabrication Center means that people can try ideas that they might have uh, without having to put the capital expense up front. So it, it's, it's a great boon to the state. It's a job creator and a technology creator. Okay, uh, gives you a little background about the uh, particular program at the University of Minnesota. Uh, don't, we don't have a clip of the uh, program at the, uh, te the technical college, but we do have website information for you at the end of the program, so if you want to look more for that kind of information, 
we'll show you where to get it. Um, I don't care who starts, but what is nanotechnology and why should we be interested in it? Well, nanotechnology is, is the ability to make small structures in a nutshell. Uh, it, it's, it's important because properties of materials change when they're very small. Uh, and this gives you a way to tune the properties to get what you want depending on the application. If you can arrange structures, atoms, the way you want them to be, you can make them do a wide variety of things that they don't normally uh, accomplish. Uh, we've, nano has been around for centuries, even millennia, although until very recently we didn't know how to control it. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one uh, in the uh, very early, uh, well, close to 2,000 years ago, Damascus was famous for making swords. And the, the reason their swords were better than anybody else's was because they would heat treat the, the steel in a certain way that little nano precipitates would come out of the steel and into the spaces between the grains. And it made the swords incredibly hard. They didn't know this. They just knew that if you did this, it was better. In the Middle Ages, we developed, they developed ways to stain glass. All the medieval cathedrals used nanotechnology, and they made little metal particles. They didn't know it again, but they knew it gave a color. And the reason these metal particles give a color is what we now call plasmonics. It's because if you have a kid at home, if you ever had a kid, and you put him in a bathtub, you know how this works. The kid eventually realizes that he can make a mess by moving his body back and forth with the water so that it sloshes. If he moves at the right speed, it'll slosh. If the bathtub gets smaller, you've got to move faster because the wave doesn't have to go as far. Well, little particles are so small that light is just the right speed to excite them. And depending on the size of the particle, you get different colors. So they found out how to make little tiny metal particles, put them into glass, and that's how they got the colored glass in the medieval churches. Different chemicals would give you different colors because it made different size particles. Now we know how to control these things. Mm -hmm. Now we can make a wide variety of structures at very small scale, mainly because we can see them, mainly because we have the tools that we can tell what we're making, and then we can feed that back and optimize the process. This is, it's been around a while. I think you said the University of Minnesota has worked in this field for about 20 years. Is the... Uh, kinds of development that we're seeing, is it multiplying at much quicker rates now than it did even 10 years ago? Absolutely. It's just taking off exponentially. Uh, very early on, uh, it was, can you make some unusual nanostructure and take a picture? And that was considered a big advance. But now what's happening is it's moving into products very aggressively. Uh, you can make things that... Uh, wear better, they're lighter, they don't abrade, they, they have the right optical properties. Uh, 3M, for example, makes a dental filling, uh, a restorative, the dentist would say. Uh, if you put in a normal restorative, after it ages, after you brush your teeth enough times, it looks dull. But if you make it out of nanoparticles, it doesn't get dull. They can keep it for 20 years and it stays the same. Wow. And you <clears throat> see, one of the things that this points out is the applicability of the technology. It goes into so many different fields. Uh, it, it isn't a field in itself. It makes other fields better. And one of the things we want to do this evening is to show our viewers how this nanotechnology is going to start impacting their lives mm -hmm. wherever they live. Deb, do you want to take a second and give us a couple <laughs> little demonstrations about sure. sort of the, some of the foundation <clears throat> principles here? To. You bet. Have at it. And, and, and in addition to <clears throat> Excuse me. What Steve said, you know, nano being the ability to make things, and and we've created tools now that allow us to see and observe the nano world, which is at the molecular and atomic level. So we're certainly getting to the point where we can make nanoscale structures and measure them and understand them. But just being able to replicate nature is a phenomenal aspect of nanotechnology. There's a lot of of aspects um, that exist in nature, and I'll show you something similar to the lotus leaf in a little bit. But as 
as you think of nanotechnology as just dealing with things at the molecular and atomic level, very, very small, what we're finding is there is a critical dependence on the property of the material depending upon how those atoms are arranged. And so what I've got here, I've brought a couple fun experiments for you. And the first one that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to do is it's something called a cross-linked polymer. So this cross-linked polymer has atoms that are arranged in a specific way. And so those atoms, because they're arranged in a specific way, it's just kind of a white powder. I'd like you to feel it and maybe describe it. It feels almost like a real, real light rain sand. Yeah. Very, 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 very light. It, it's kind of grainy and it's room temperature. It sort of feels warm and it's hard. And now, so the atoms that create these properties in this material are arranged in a certain way. And just like charcoal and diamond, which are both made out of exactly the same element, carbon, but the atoms, the carbon atoms are arranged differently in charcoal than they are in a diamond. And so obviously I think we would all acknowledge that they have different value, different properties. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is add some water and actually by adding the water, you're playing scientist. You're going to be a scientist and you're actually getting in there and rearranging the atoms of, you're interacting the water molecules with the atoms of the cross-linked polymer. And in doing that, we're going to change the property of, of the material, of the combined material. And so after you've added some water, you might you can see it's getting kind of fluffy and it almost it, looks like a cloud. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It really does. It, it, it it's, does. It's, it's very pretty. I don't know if it looks the like it's going to pick up that cloud small difference, but and um, so so what you've done now is I'll ask you to feel it and tell me how the properties are now. <clears throat> it's almost like real fine rubber. It's very light. It doesn't feel anything granular anymore. Right. right. It feels soft and smooth, and it's cold. You know, it's cooler than the air. It, it's just such a tactically pleasing experiment. But what you've done is by adding the water, you've rearranged the atoms in that cross-linked polymer, and you've changed the physical properties. Just like charcoal, under the pressure and temperature of the earth, those atoms are rearranged, and we end up with a diamond. And, and I always laugh when I think of the... Um, way back in the olden days when they were making the windows of the cathedral, you know, you had this poor little glass apprentice boy <laughs> that, you know, somebody gives him, here, take this and go stir it for eight hours and then come in and mix it with the, with the glass. And you know that if you mix this chemical or grind this stuff for so long that it'll give you red glass. But then you've got some other poor apprentice who has to grind it for 10 hours, but he'll end up with blue glass. And so that's the, that's the beauty of having different sized nanoparticles in a glass um, that will give you the different colors. And so it, it's so much a structure or an example of how the structure of the atoms is going to change, impact the physical properties. And nature does it all the time. And with some of the tools that you saw in the video, you know, at Steve's... Um, lab and up at the university, we've got microscopes, we still call them microscopes, that can see, observe individual atoms so we can watch them change. What else you got? Well. I'll move this one out of our way. Yeah, let me, we're, we'll switch from the polymers to, let me show you, this is um, a glass slide, I'll pick a bigger one, that I have put on it. Um, I've coated it with just rubber I'm cement. Yeah, let's use the white. I'm going to put it on the back of the pen white paper so there we can go. see that a little better. And what I put on it is, is some stuff that you can buy on the Internet. It's called Magic Sand. But this sand has been uh, coated with a super hydrophobic coating. And super hydrophobic means that it, is, it really dislikes water. It doesn't react with water. In fact, I, you can make this stuff at home, and I was doing it once with my daughter, or I was doing it once at home. Sand, you spray it, you put it in the oven, you take it out, you mix it, you spray it some more with like Scotch Guard, comes out and Adrian walks in and I'm pulling this cookie tray out of the oven and she looks at it and it's a pile of sand and she just <laughs> looks at me and goes, Mom, most mothers make cookies for their children when they come home. And I said, yeah, but this sand is really cool. So what I've done is just attach that sand to the glass slide. And so why don't you take 
um, a dropper of water and just put a drop of water on that sand. And yeah, you can kind of hold it up. There you go. Whoops. If we, we don't have a level, floor, level yeah, we don't have a level table. <laughs> there, but but what what you see is exactly what happens at a lotus leaf. That that uh, what is a lotus leaf? I'm not familiar with well, that. Well, the lotus leaf is the leaf of a plant. It's also kind of a universal symbol for purity, because the leaves of the lotus plant are always very clean. And what we've learned, oh, I've, I've got goosebumps because it's cool. What we've learned <laughs> by studying the leaf of the lotus plant is that it has a bumpy structure, but it also has a chemical structure, which we're mimicking in this sandy surface. And in that structure of the lotus leaf, we are able to keep that water in like a spherical pattern, that spherical shape. And so that's what, you know, we've got a big water droplet, so gravity's impacting us a little bit here too. But that's what's happening there. Now, this is really cool. If you take a little bit of pepper and sprinkle it on, on the um, sand, just to represent debris that might end up on the leaf. And now if you can roll that water around, or you can control it with the transfer pipette, Kind of roll that around. Whoops, it's going to have way. to get some more. <laughs> it's it's tricky. What's going to happen is as you move that. Oh, oh there right. we go. Perfect. As we as the water rolled across the sandy surface, it picked up the pepper that was on here, Pull ran it off, and it's and, perfectly dry. And it's perfectly dry that. and clean there. So that's why the lotus leaf is so pure because any dust or you know debris or pieces of sticks or straw or whatever that falls on it, as soon as the rain comes, it's going to carry that debris off. This is, this is um, a phenomena that we're beginning to understand, started out in nature. We've created tools so we can replicate it. Now think if you had a super hydrophobic surface that could keep perhaps zebra mussels from attaching to a boat, or barnacles, the Navy people, you know, are using... Um, looking for a material like this to keep barnacles off the side of the boat. Or um, prosthetic so things developers, can't stick to it things at all. can't stick to it, can't and it's to. easier to clean. <clears throat> it's also easier to clean. Trach, trach tubes. Um, a lot of people, unfortunately, will die from infections that are as a result of inserting trach tubes. So if you can coat those tubes with a surface that slides easier, then it's not going to catch on the, the lining of the esophagus or the material and prevent, um, reduce the number of infections. So there's a lot of different applications that are, are as a result of these types of well, things. Well, let's just take a minute and talk about what are some of those applications. What are the things that the average person is going to see that really is a result of nanotechnology? Uh, I think it starts with A. Let's talk a little bit about agriculture because we do have a fair amount of agriculture in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Would you like to? Uh... Well, I can I can certainly cover that. I think that um, nanotechnology, in in many ways, is going to impact agriculture. One one way is um, is in terms of sensing whether it's an infestation of insects or whether it's a fungicide or a herb, you know a fungus or a something that's trying to damage the crops. <laughs> I, I know I don't have the quite the right word, but. By, by using nano-based sensors in agricultural fields, you can, you can figure out where something's happening much earlier. My dad was a farmer, and I can remember him walking through the fields and looking for infestations. Now if we have sensors that are widely distributed in the field, they can pick up infestations much sooner than my father or any farmer would be able to visually observe something so if going on. So there aphids or mites or something yes, like that? Yes, any of that. Actually, let me amplify on that because that's an application we've, we've worked on. Uh, one of the applications we, projects we did in our laboratory that you showed on a little clip was for termites. Mm -hmm. And uh, termites, when they attack uh, wood, chew, but they chew with a noise at a particular pitch. And we made uh, sensors to look for that sound, that pitch <laughs> sound. And it was detected, it was connected to an antenna, and it would call the orchid man and say, come in and do the termites. Mm -hmm. But you can make these sensors for pennies, and they're autonomous, and you can distribute them mm -hmm. widely. You can imagine the Department of Defense is interested in this kind of thing. 
for similar applications. Mm -hmm. So if you were out in a field, uh, like a, a soybean field, mm -hmm. right? Uh, how, how does that information get from the plant to the person getting it? So usually the chip would have a little photocell on it, so it would take the sunlight and convert it to energy, and it would send out a radio wave uh, that it could be picked up by a base station, could be picked up by the tractor, could be picked mm -hmm. up by the uh, base station at home. It doesn't require a whole lot of power to transmit, you know, a mile or so. And then how are those uh, dissolved at the end of the season? <laughs> is that the challenge? Oh, that is oh, one of the challenges. <laughs> that is indeed one of the challenges. Okay. Because uh, but, they won't but the last technology forever. is there now to get the information. Right. So uh, that's actually one of the areas that people work on. The early demonstrations were done on things that don't dissolve. Can you put it on something that after a season uh, that it would go away and be benign? What, what else might you be seeing in agriculture? What other areas? I think that um, another, another aspect of that is um, in terms of being able to use every bit of the plant. You know, a lot of, of some of the, we, um, we can make materials, actually polymers, out of corn stalks. And so that by doing that, we reduce our dependency on crude oils. So I think nanotechnology is, is helping us helping us understand the interior structure of a lot of the plants so that we don't throw things mm -hmm. away. You watch a combine going down the field and there's a lot of stuff coming out the back end of the combine. And, and there's a lot of people that are looking at this material at the nano scale and trying to figure out how to use it. In fact, there's a company in our um, state friend to the east in Wisconsin that actually uses not the pulp from oranges, but the white stuff from oranges, the non, the non-nutritional stuff. They get it, they dry it, and they're using it um, to make a material that ends up going into um, cat food, the soft cat food, and um, shoot, I'm trying to remember a few <laughs> other things. But that that came about because by understanding some of the properties of the material in the orange. We've determined ways that we could separate it, determine ways that we could use it. And so there's, I, I think that um, Cargill and a lot of companies in, in northern Minnesota and the, our North Dakota and South Dakota neighbors are looking at ways that we can, we can use every bit of the plant. We're going to save some of the applications for our second part of this particular show, but I know that you have a unique relationship between the Dakota County Technical College and University of Minnesota. <laughs> we only have about five minutes left. But, <laughs> Maybe let's just talk a little bit about what it is that you're doing there and how you're trying to attract students into this field. Have at it, <laughs> however you like. Please, you can start. Do you want me to? Okay. Absolutely. Oh, Steve and I met uh, first in, in 2003 when Dakota County Technical College was looking at starting a nanoscience technician program. And, and the, the place that we started, and, and I was just a, a person in the audience kind of at this first meeting, but what they wanted to do was ask companies in Minnesota, not, and I'm not just talking about the Twin Cities, but companies all around Minnesota, if we create people that understand nanoscience, will you hire them? And the answer came out a, a resounding yes. But not just at the PhD level. Yes. The, it was clear that nanotechnology was going from research into products, and you needed people who could make those products. Which is a perfect match for, for what DCTC college. does. Mm -hmm. However, you know, we have a limited budget in terms of what we can afford for equipment. We've got a fairly nice, a very well, a million dollars worth of equipment in our nano lab. But Steve at the University of Minnesota has tens of millions of dollars. And so the arrangement we have is students come to DCTC for the first three semesters. They go to the University of Minnesota for the fourth semester, where they're taught by professors like like Steve and an amazing group. It's, it's just a phenomenal relationship and the industries that use our students, these are technician, two-year degree students. I've got more companies asking me for students than I have students to give them. And so we need more students are, in are, these programs. Are you finding that so many students don't really know what this is? That's it's, hard to attract I think them. that's, yep, I think that's part of it. And and even if a student is excited about it, a lot of times the parents or maybe even their friends at school may go, what in, 
what in the world is nanotechnology and why would you like to do that? And Steve and I are also part of a National Science Foundation funded regional center for nanotechnology education. <laughs> it's a mouthful. It's called NanoLink. And um, I'm, I'm the director for that center and we have partners in North Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Iowa. And we're spreading out across um, across the Midwest and across the entire country. So we have, we have um, a lot of partners and our, our um, focus is on creating nanotechnology education, which includes fun activities <laughs> like the, I've shown you here. The, the driving reason here is that as products are being developed, jobs are going up rapidly. Mm -hmm. And are these jobs paying well? Yes. <clears throat> what sort of range do you think students would be looking at in the graduates of your programs? For, for a two-year degree, it is, it is uh, very consistent. It's around a starting salary, around 40000 Most of them will, within a couple years, will have an easy a 10% raise. They have unique skills, and companies are realizing the benefit of those unique skills. A lot of people that come into our program also are changing careers, mm -hmm. or they're returning veterans, so they come with a set of skills already, um, whether it's an MBA or whether it's airline mechanic, it can get um, enhanced through the knowledge of, of understanding nanoscience technology. Or they come in thinking they don't like science, <laughs> yeah. and uh, they wind uh -huh. up going on, one of them's going on for a PhD now. Right. Uh, Some of my students. <laughs> roughly 40% go on for a bachelor's degree mm -hmm. just because this is really cool. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Just, uh, we've got a less than a minute left. What, what are your websites? We're uh, www.dctc.edu, and then if you just search under programs, you'll find the Nanoscience Technologist program. Very easy. And ours is www.nano.umn.edu, and we have a, a place that you can look at all the research that's going on at the University in Nano. Uh, you can kind of browse through a brief summary of different programs. Okay. Uh, and I think those will be on the, at the end of the program, too, so people get another chance to write that down. <laughs> so you're always looking for students. There's openings. They're, they're oh, yeah. not full at this stage. <laughs> and it's a really exciting uh, field. It's mm -hmm. a very exciting field. Mm -hmm. And because there's so much information about this, uh, if you just are tuning in to us, <clears throat> our next program on November 15th is going to be part two of this. And we're going to actually spend a little more time in part two talking about the applications of uh, nanotechnology. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time. <laughs>